This month on Everyday AI, we're talking about reinforcement learning. As always, if you have any questions about the material that I cover in this video, as well as if you have any topics that you'd like for me to cover in future AI 101s, let me know in the comments. I will be down there answering questions and taking requests. Let's get started. When we talk about reinforcement learning, we're generally talking about algorithms that train an agent to reach a goal based on a reward. Does that sound vague to you? Well, it's because reinforcement learning is a kind of umbrella term that's used to encapsulate a lot of methods that have been used by a lot of other disciplines of the past. In fact, many of the original reinforcement learning models came out of control theory, economics, statistics, and genetics. And don't we always train an agent to achieve a goal based on a reward when we're developing AI systems? Well, yeah, we do. The difference when it comes to reinforcement learning is that we're often looking at long-term goals. Instead of designing a classifier to match an input to an output, we're given a starting point and an end point, and we want the algorithm to figure out how to get there on its own. Because of this, a reinforcement learning algorithm doesn't need samples with paired labels. Instead, we give it a place to start and a target to reach, and we can let it explore on its own. We've discussed reinforcement learning on this channel before. In fact, we discussed it in my video on the YouTube algorithm because the YouTube recommendation system currently runs on reinforcement learning. In that case, the goal of the algorithm is to maximize the amount of time that you're spending watching videos on YouTube. Reinforcement learning is also likely used on other social media platforms for recommendations, although they don't publish their algorithms, so we'll never know. But outside of that, reinforcement learning isn't necessarily something that we see implemented in AI systems that we'd interact with on a daily basis. Instead, we see reinforcement learning used to learn how to beat some of the world's greatest players in games like Go and Dota 2, models hypotheses on things like how our brains work or genetic evolution, and that generally tries to get a better understanding of how a reinforcement learning algorithm learns to go from point A to point B. Basically, reinforcement learning can be applied to problems with long-term payoffs. You don't want to predict the next step you should take in this one game, you want to predict how to win the game. An example that might be easier to visualize is some older research from DeepMind and some newer research from OpenAI. A few years ago, DeepMind released a bunch of videos displaying a stick figure learning how to run using reinforcement learning. Well, kind of. What DeepMind had actually asked the stick figure to do was to learn how to get from point A to point B within some loose limitations. For example, the stick figure could not extend the length of its limbs. The idea behind the setup and these constraints is that the stick figure would learn how to run as the most efficient way to get from point A to point B. In some cases it did. In others, not so much. More recently, OpenAI developed a multi-agent system where one agent would learn how to defend against another. They began with more simple situations and increased complexity by adding more agents, more obstacles, and more supplies that the agents could use to defend themselves or to overcome other defenses. That was pretty cool, or at least I thought. But how does it actually work? Well, it depends on the type of model you're developing. In this video, we're going to focus on three types of algorithms going from less complex to more complex. The field is actually much more diverse than this, but to do a video on that would take an entire semester, and I know that because I'm basically taking a class on it next semester. We'll start with basic control theory. Actually, it's getting a little cold in here. Hold on. And that's control theory for you. I'm kidding, but I'm also not. One of the most basic examples of control theory is actually our own bodies. In this case, there is a given temperature that I would like to stay at, and my apartment is not currently at that temperature. It's a little bit cold because it's freezing in Boston. I, as the controller, am adjusting the variables in my surroundings in order to get back to that temperature that I want to be at, which we call a set point. There are other variables that I could change too. Since I'm too cold, I could put on a sweater. If I were too hot, I could change into something cooler. When I'm at my parents' house for the holidays, I don't need to change the temperature myself at all. We have a thermostat that once you set it at a certain temperature, it will adjust the heat and the AC to keep the house at that temperature until you change it. 
From a more technical perspective, the goal of a control system is to maintain an environment at a set point, ideally without delays or overshooting. These systems accomplish this by measuring the environment, and this can be done in a couple different ways depending on what exactly the thing you're trying to control is, comparing that measurement to the set point, calculating an error based on that comparison, and then adjusting your output to the environment to bring it back to that set point. I'll quickly note that I'm referring to closed loop control systems as opposed to open loop control, where the controller is not necessarily connected to the feedback system. For example, the temperature control at my parents' house is a closed loop system. Given a set point, it will adjust the heating and cooling of the house to meet that point. On the other hand, me leaving the heat on when I leave for lab is an open control system. The heat's gonna stay on no matter what the temperature of the house is until I get back. Now, control theory can be way more complex than this. I personally typically work with PID controllers, which take an integral and a derivative in an attempt to approximate how the current environment is going to change in order to match the set point as best as possible for the future. So if you wanna learn more about that, I've included some resources in the description box. Next up is policy optimization. To talk about policy optimization, we have to talk a little bit about Markov decision processes first. Markov decision processes have four parts. A set of states, a set of actions, a transition function, and a reward function. At any given time, the algorithm is in some state and it must choose an action. The probability of an algorithm choosing any particular action given its state is defined by the transition function. Once an algorithm chooses an action, it moves to a new state, and the reward function is updated based on that decision. The policy in this case is the transition function mapped across the probability of taking any particular action while at a given state. Policy optimization is therefore optimizing the policy to maximize your reward. This would theoretically lead to a high probability of you reaching whatever your end goal is. Reinforcement learning algorithms that are based on policy optimization may need to take a large number of steps or take a large number of actions in order to reach that end goal. So even though a particular action at a given state might have a very high reward associated with it, that doesn't actually mean it's the right action to take if you want to win the entire game. A recent example of policy optimization is OpenAI's work in creating a robot hand that can solve a Rubik's Cube. I'll quickly note that they trained a simulation of a robot hand to solve a Rubik's Cube on a computer and then translated that knowledge to a real robot hand. The video makes it seem like they just like stuck a Rubik's Cube in a robot hand and like let it go, which isn't what happened. <laughs> Similar to control theory, there are a ton of different types of policy optimization, so if you're interested in learning more, I've included resources in the description. Finally, we have deep reinforcement learning. We've talked about deep learning in past AI 101 videos, and deep reinforcement learning isn't actually that different. Unlike the previous types of algorithms we've talked about, Deep reinforcement learning takes deep neural networks and optimizes them using reinforcement learning optimizers. So you might use a policy optimization on a neural network. A version of this was used by DeepMind to develop AlphaGo, an algorithm that can play the game Go against professional Go players and win. There are other interesting types of reinforcement learning that I won't get too into the weeds on, things like inverse reinforcement learning where you don't give the algorithm a reward function and so it has to figure it out, or where you don't give it formal training data and instead you just show it somebody doing the thing you want it to do and it learns from that. Again, if you want more information, link's in the description. So you've watched this far into the video and now you're interested in trying your hand at developing your own reinforcement learning algorithm. Well, if you don't have a background in programming, I highly recommend that you check out my video on how to learn AI for free because the resource that I'm going to recommend does assume that you have a background in programming first. My main recommendation is the OpenAI Gym, and I swear that I'm not sponsored by OpenAI, they just develop a lot of very cool open source stuff. It's essentially a set of code that lets you develop reinforcement learning models really easily without having to understand the theory behind it and train it on data sets that they just have for you so you also don't have to mine your own data. It's super easy to install and use. I highly recommend it. So it's very user friendly. And if you're interested in getting started, that's where I'd recommend starting. If you watched this video and weren't interested in developing your own reinforcement learning algorithm, that's also okay. So I'll wrap up with a little bit about how reinforcement learning might impact your life. As mentioned, it's definitely probably a part of many social media recommendation systems, which affects how you engage with social media for better or for worse. 
And we're also seeing it move into the medical field so that we can make long-term predictions based on people's health data. In general, I think reinforcement learning is really interesting because even though we had that big AI boom in the late 90s, early 2000s, because we had the computational power and the data sets to train good models, we're now starting to get to the point where we have decades of data on single people or single tasks, and that's where reinforcement learning really performs well. So hopefully, going forward, we might be able to predict the future. If you like this video, you can let me know by subscribing to my channel and smashing that like button. If you have other AI 101 video recommendations or you have questions about this video, definitely leave them in the comments and I will try to answer as many of them as possible. Otherwise, thank you so much to my patrons for making this possible. The Patreon-only Q&A livestream is this Sunday, so if you're not currently a patron and you would like to join, you still have time to sign up. Otherwise, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.